Okay, today's DAF is Beitza Kavzayin. Today's DAF is sponsored by Jason, Eric, and Raquel in honor of the birthday of our mom, Patty Belkin. Mom, you love, support, and inspire us every day. Mazel Tov on your birthday. And by Lisa Denker in honor of Stephen Denker on his 70th birthday. Happy, happy 70th, all my love, Zis. And by Hannah Katzman in memory of her brother, Shalom Pinchas Ben Ben Sion and Tai Begitel Wachholder. And by Gita Neufeld, in loving memory of my special mother-in-law, Alice Neufeld, Edelbat Nathan, Allah, Allah Shalom, who treated me like Naomi treated Ruth. She was so proud of her family and their dedication to the ideals of Torah in Derech Eretz. At the time when many chose to send their children to the New York City public schools, she and my father-in-law sacrificed joyfully to ensure that their two sons received, received a quality yeshiva education, laying the foundations for four generations of Shomrei Torah Mitzvot across the globe. My, I miss you every day, especially when I set the table, and I'm certain that you celebrate my learning. Okay, we're going to get started with our daf. We were finishing up a sugya about this idea of yesh muksa lechatsi shabbat o'en. Just to refresh your memory, we started with this topic of a mum in an animal. Are you allowed to show when you have a bachor and you want to eat the firstborn animal, the only way you can eat it, again, once there's no longer a temple. When in the temple, you were bringing in sacrifice within the temple, unless it had a blemish. Once there's no longer a temple, the only way you can eat it is if it gets a blemish and a permanent blemish. And the only person who can determine this is a chacham. You can't determine it yourself. You have to bring it to a chacham. Are you allowed to do that? And are you not? Rabbi Shimon says you cannot. Rabbi Yehuda says you can. And then we had a whole debate about that. We're going to get back to it. In the context of that, the Gemara asked, is there a concept of muqsa the chatsi shabbat or a muqsa the chatsi shabbat? And then we tried to use this brighter that was quoted to get an answer about whether we whether we would say yes there is or yes there isn't or or uh, sorry or no there isn't. What does it mean yesh muktzah lechatzis shabbat? I'm not going to go back over the proof and all that, but yesh muktzah lechatzis shabbat means if something again the determining time is always the beginning of shabbat. If shabbat comes in or yantif comes in and it's something that is usable on shabbat or yom tov. It's not mukta, but what if something happens to it and it gets ruined or for whatever reason, it becomes unusable during Shabbat or Yantif and then reverts back to being usable? If we say yesh mukta lechatsi Shabbat, it means you can have a partial mukta on Shabbat, which means once it became mukta, even if it becomes back to being usable, we don't, we don't let it. It's mukta for the rest of that Shabbat. A mukta lechatsi Shabbat means if it was just for a certain amount of time, just that time, we say so, but it goes back to being usable since at the beginning of Shabbat, it was fine. Therefore, it's going to be fine later on also. So we tried to bring, as I said, a potential proof from the Brita or, or rejection from the Brita to the two different answers that were given according to the two different versions, either yes, there is, or no, there isn't. Then we brought another proof of the Grogrod and Simukim, which we said in the end has nothing to do with this. It's not a case of... It was, it became disqualified, you know, unusable, and then went, reverted back to being usable, which means we can't learn from this anything. And now we have our fourth case, which as I already told you yesterday, is also going to be inconclusive. So the Gemara says, Tashma, let's learn from me, Polin Adashim, I'm at the very bottom of Kavvav Amud Bet. So we can learn from Polin Adashim. Daha Polin Adashim, Meikaru, Meikara Chazu Lachos. When they're in the beginning, you can chew on them. When you just have, Lentils, right? We don't generally do this, but you could theoretically chew on them, right? And therefore, they're prepared already when they're raw. Shadinu bikdera idchule. But when you put them in a pot, they then become rejected. In other words, what's the problem? When they're cooking, right? You can cook these things on yantif. Now, if you cook them on yantif, so this is going to prove our point. It starts off as being worthy of chewing on, okay? Then it turns into, you throw them in the pot, they're no longer, right? You put it in the pot, which basically means you don't intend to touch these until they're finished boiling, right? No one's going to go into the pot and eat them from there. So therefore, for that moment that they're cooking, they're set aside, they're muktza. Kamar bishulayu, you finish cooking them, chazule. They become already back to worthy of being eaten. And you obviously can eat them. Otherwise, what would be the point of permitting cooking on yantif if during the process of cooking, they become muktza. And then if we say, yesh muktza lechatsi shabbat, which would then apply to yantav as well, we would say, well, look, while they were cooking, you set them aside, you weren't planning to eat them. And then when they become worthwhile again, well, since they were already muktza for that time period, they're going to be muktza for the rest. Well, obviously that's not the case. So therefore we must say, ein muktza lechatsi shabbat. And yes, it's true for that few minutes while they were cooking, 
they were not worthy for anything and they were muktzah, but they go back to being fine afterwards. So Abayi says, this is not a good proof. Amr alma. But then you'd never be able to eat any food on Shabbat that was hot. Why? Regular pots in the beginning of Shabbat. Banish mashot. Now remember, what's the determining time on, in general? It's banish mashot. What's their status, banish mashot? Banish mashot, rotchotin. They're basically boiling and nobody eats right then banish mashot. So that means when you've put them, like let's say, you know, Shabbat starts, you put your food on the plata, it's boiling hot. You basically don't intend to eat that food until after you make kiddush, right? So that food for those moments while it's on the plata there is basically set aside a muksa. You might say it doesn't really, I don't know if you would call that the same muktza, but what he's basically saying is if you're going to say when you're cooking the lentils, they're muktza, you would say the same thing for all these pots when Shabbat starts, in which case, right, and yet at night we all eat from these pots. So Ella, he says, you're comparing the wrong, you're basically taking an example of something that's not what we were talking about. Muktza lechasi Shabbat is not an example where I put something out of use for a few minutes right, by either putting it on the plata on, in the beginning of Shabbat or by boiling up my lentils on yant. That's I wasn't asking about something that was done by, by us, that we put it out of commission for a little while. That's not considered muktza, or that wouldn't be a case of where you'll say, oh, yesh muktza lechatsi Shabbat, once I made it muktza for a period, it's going to stay muktza. No, 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 that wasn't the question. What I was talking about is, if somehow not by my control, by the hands of God, you know, something happened, like for example, when we talked about that potential example with the, with the raisins, they were drying on the roof and then, you know, maybe the rain came or something happened to them and they went, right, and they became unusable. That's what we're asking about. Not an example like this, where you put it out of commission, that's not the same thing. And in which case we're back to square one, where we don't really have an answer to the question. We did have an answer, but we had, the answer was either yesh muksa or a muksa, but those were two different versions of the same answer. So we don't really know which one. We brought two other, one was a source, and this was a, a situation where it was obvious, right? It wasn't a source, but it was obvious that when you're cooking, right, we're not turning things into muksa, otherwise you wouldn't be allowed to cook on yant if it wouldn't help you. So we brought two examples to try to prove it. In the end, we said both those examples aren't really what they were asking about, and therefore we don't have an answer. Now we're back to our main topic about Bechor. Can you, so now we have this machlok at Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Shema. The question is, who do we hold like? Are you allowed to show a mum to a chacham or not? Rabbi Yehuda said you could. And then again, remember the, the boar, the Bechor fell into the boar, he fell into the pit. You can, according to Rabbi Yehuda, bring a chacham down, let him check it out. If it's a problem and the mum is really a blemish, a serious one, then take it out and you can shecht it. According to Rabbi Shema, you're not allowed to check it at all, so no. So now, this is obviously a very relevant topic because if people have Bechor in their possession and they wanted to eat it on Yantif and they didn't check the blemish, so we're going to see that this is a question that seemed to have bothered a lot of people. Rabbi Yehuda Nesia. Who's Rabbi Yehuda Nesia? He is the grandson of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. He was also a Nasi, okay, which was like a, a, a job. I just want to point out, okay, sometimes you have to, again, read between the lines here. If he was a Nasi, he, the Nasi was always from Shevet Yehuda, right? This whole dynasty was a, you know, the Hillel, Rabban Gamliel, the Yehuda, all of them were part of this dynasty, all from Shevet Yehuda. Why is that important? Well, if he's from Shevet Yehuda, he's not a Kohen. What's he doing with a Bechor? Okay, that's, that's like a side question, which Rashi points out, he must have had in his house a lot of Kwanim eating with him. Because remember, the Nasi entertained a lot of people. And it must have been, it was a Bechor that belonged to someone who came, you know, was part of his household. Like maybe one of his helpers was a Kohen and he had a Bechor. Okay, otherwise, it doesn't really make sense, the story. The other thing to know about him is why is he called Nasi and not Hanasi if he was also the Nasi? That's just to distinguish him from Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, who was his grandfather. So if you want to know who it is, they called him Nasi instead of Hanasi. So Rabbi Yehuda Nasi Havale Ahu Bechor, he had a Bechor in his possession. Shadre Lekamei de Rabbi Ami. He sends it to Rabbi Ami. Sever de Lola Mechsiei. Rabbi Ami didn't really want to check it. Okay, he said, I don't do that thing on Yantif. Amale Rabbi Zreka, Vitema Rabbi Yirmiya. So Rabbi Zreka, or maybe Rabbi Yirmiya starts to question. And he says to him, Rabbi Yehuda for Rabbi Shimon, Halachakir Rabbi Yehuda. 
when you have a machlek of Rabbi Yudah, Rabbi Shimon, we pass like Rabbi Yudah. So why are you passing like Rabbi Shimon here? Hagar Shadre, the Kameh Rabbi Yisrael Nafka. So, right, when you don't like what one rabbi says, so he goes to another rabbi to have him check the moon. Sabre de Lomichsi. He also didn't want to look at it. Amrle Rabbi Yirmiyah, Vitem Rabbi Zreka. Again, the same two people, although the order is switched, right? Either Rabbi Yirmiyah asked or Rabbi Zreka asked. Rabbi Yudah, Rabbi Shimon, Alachake Rabbi Yudah. So Amrle Rabbi Abba. Rabbi Abba comes and responds. My time, lo shavaktinu le Rabbanan, le meabad uvda ke Rabbi Shimon. He says, why, what, what's the reason you keep bothering all these rabbis not to hold like Rabbi Shimon? In other words, what, what do you care if they hold like Rabbi Shimon and they don't check these mumim? Not really what do you care, but why are you so motivated to stop them from holding like Rabbi Shimon? We don't really get an answer about this. I mean, I think the answer is obvious. He wants to, right? They want to be allowed to slaughter the meat. And Yantif, right? There's also, remember, we've discussed in the beginning, let me say, there's Simchat Yom Tov on the other hand, right? We want to have meat for the holiday. But he doesn't really respond. Instead, Amar Le, he responds back with a question. And he says to him, Va'ad ma biyadach. What's, you know, don't ask me what my motivation is to pas, the, not paskin like Rabbi Shimon. What's your motivation to paskin like Rabbi Shimon? Okay? As, why are you so pushing and saying, right? Don't, what, what's, what's, what's the pull to paskin like Rabbi Shimon? So Amar Le, ha'chi ama Rabbi Zerah, halachaka Rabbi Shimon. It's because Rabbi Zera passed in this way. And as we all want to pass in like Rabbi Shimon, because Rabbi Zera held like Rabbi Shimon on this issue. Well, we're going to see. Did Rabbi Zera really hold like him? How did they know Rabbi Zera held like him? And we're going to see. Rabbi Zera was from Israel. So it was kind of this tradition that was from a distance. So Amar Mandahu, so and so, okay, a, a, a person, we don't know who he is, a Mandahu, a person. Said, I want to hear it straight from his mouth. And as Halavai, I can go on Aliyah to Israel, right? When you think about going on Aliyah, you don't necessarily think it's so that you can ask this one question about the Bechor and Rabbi Zeh really hold this way. But this apparently was bothering him. He says, Halavai, I will, go up to, I will go up to Israel and I will find out what he really says. Did he really say this? I want to hear it straight from his mouth. Kislik Lahatam. So when he did eventually go to Israel, right? First thing he does, probably, he goes and he finds Rabbi Zera. Amale, he says to him, Amar Mar, halachake Rabbi Shimon, did you really say halachalik Rabbi Shimon? Amar Le, lo, huh, surprisingly, okay, for good reason he wanted to hear it straight from his mouth. He suspected something was up, I guess. So he said, no, I didn't say that. What I said was, and this is right, very always, this, you have to be very careful with what you say, how you say it, because people will always misconstrue your words. He said, I said, it seems like Rabbi Shimon is right here. I didn't say we hold like him. I just said that he seems to be the correct opinion. On what basis does he think that? It said in the Mishnah, our Mishnah, Rabbi Shimon Omel, Kol she'ein mumo nikar mi ba'od yom, ein zemin amuchan. If the moon is not recognizable from before, meaning they didn't determine it was a moon before Yantif, then it's not minamucha, meaning you can't do it. And that line appeared in the Braita. Remember Rabbi Shaya brought a Braita? If you look back at yesterday's Mubet, about 15 lines down from the top. Remember Rabbi Shaya came and he brought this Braita from Eretz Israel that said, Bein shenolaba, I'm quoting from there. Whether the moon was before Yantif there or whether it was on Yantif. Whose shita is that? Rabbi Shimon's. Who is it said in the name of? Chachamim. When you have Rabbi Shimon and Rabbi Yehuda up against each other, you have an individual versus an individual. But when you have Rabbi Shimon's opinion quoted by the Chachamim, all of a sudden you see the majority seems to hold like Rabbi Shimon. So he says, since it says it in the Brayta, exactly what Rabbi Shimon said in the Mishnah, in the word in the mouths of the rabbis now, it seems like it would seem logical that we must hold like him because if we didn't hold like him, why would the rabbis be saying his opinion? So therefore, he said it seems like, but he didn't say I pass in this way. So now we're back to square one, really. I mean, it does seem like we hold like Rabbi Shimon, but still the Gemara is not convinced because no one really came out with a psaf that said the halacha is like Rabbi Shimon. So my havela. So what? What's the situation? So they keep trying to bring clear-cut proofs, which in the end, some of them are not really so clear-cut, that we hold like Rabbi Shimon. So here's our next one. This one's going to be a little more complicated. Amar Rav Yosef. Tashma. Let's learn from here. 
Detalia ba Ashley Ravrabe. This is something that's hanging on the the hanging on the ropes of, of, of great men. Okay, meaning we're gonna have a whole slew of people who all are gonna pass him. We're gonna see in the end, like Rabbi Mayer. And we're going to try to prove that Rabbi Meir matches Rabbi Shimon. This is going to be the tricky part. In the end, they're going to say, no, they really can't prove it from here. But let's see what they say. So Amar, let's see who all these great people are. Amar Rabbi Shimon ben Pasi. Amar Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. Amar Rabbi Yossi ben Shaul. This means Rabbi Shimon ben Pasi said it in the name of Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. He said it in the name of Rabbi Yossi ben Shaul. Amar Rabbi, he said in the name of Rabbi, Rabbi Yudanasi. Mishum kahala kadisha b'dibri Yushalayim. In the name of the... The Kahal, the Kahala Kadosh, the sanctified community of Jerusalem, which we said a few days ago was often attributed to Rabbi Shimon ben Manasseh and another rabbi. Here it's going to be a little tricky to say that because the Kahala Kadosh of Yerushalayim is going to say the Rabbi Shimon v'chaverav amru alacha ke Rabbi Meir. Now we assume this doesn't mean Rabbi Shimon, the Rabbi Shimon in our Mishnah, Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai, because that wouldn't make sense anyway. We're trying to figure out do we hold like Rabbi Shimon or not? So that wouldn't be it. So Rashi says we're talking about Rabbi Shimon ben Manasseh. Which makes it seem like the Kala Kadisha de Bishalayim, in this case, certainly doesn't really seem like it was Rabbi Shimon ben Manasseh. But basically, all these people are quoting in the name of Rabbi Shimon ben Manasseh and his friends, who all said, Halachake Rabbi Meir. So, first, we're going to have a side question about this. We don't even know what Rabbi Meir said yet. But first, they have a, a, a small question, which is wait a minute. The ha inu kashishim in tuva. But wait, the, ka, the Rabbi Shimon. The way you have it normally is the Kala Kadisha de Rishalayim says something that Rabbi Shimon and his friends said. Usually that means his friends and Rabbi Shimon are older than the Kala Kadisha de Rishalayim. In this case, they say it's the opposite. The Kala Kadisha de Rishalayim are older than Rabbi Shimon and his friends. So it doesn't make sense that they be quoting something from younger people than them, right? It always goes, you quote the person from the previous generation. So what do they say? Ela Bishitat Rabbi Meir Amaruha. What they're saying is, notice it doesn't say Mishum Kala Kadisha de Bishalayim, Mishum Rabbi Shimon B'chaberah. It doesn't say they said it in their name, which then would have really not made sense. What it says is that they were saying the younger people of our generation, Rabbi Shimon and Chaberah, happened to pask in Halacha like Rabbi Meir. Okay, so then it's a little bit different than they're passing on their Torah. No, they're just commenting about Rabbi Shimon and, his, and their friends. In other words, here come the elders of the community and talk about the younger people and say, the younger people of our community are poskening like Rabbi Meir. Okay, so that was an aside question. But now we're going to get to what Rabbi Meir said. Ditnan, here's the Mishnah. A Mishnah in Bechorah. Hashochet et ha-bechor v'achar kach erat mumot. This is a different situation. Normally, what do you have to do? In order to permit you to slaughter the animal, you have to check it has a mum. The chacham has to say, the expert, right, determines it has a blemish, and then you can slaughter it. What if you slaughtered it before, it, before you checked the mum? And then you check the mum after the animal was dead. You bring it to the chacham. You say, I knew this had a mum. I didn't check it out, but you know, now look. Tell me if it's okay. And he says, it's okay. <clears throat> can you eat that meat? because you really did it in the wrong order. So Rabbi Yehuda Matil, he allows you to eat the meat. And Rabbi Meir Omer, Ho'il v'nishchat shelo al pi mumche asul. He says, listen, this was slaughtered not by a mumche. You didn't do it in the right way. And therefore it's forbidden to eat the meat. What does this have to do with our situation? So now they're gonna say from here, so if we hold like Rabbi Meir there, Alma kasaval Rabbi Meir. From here you can infer the what? Rabbi Meir holds. Riyat bechor, lav ki riyat trefa. That checking a bechor is not like checking for a trefa. Okay, what's checking for a trefa? Normally you slaughter an animal and then you open it up. Remember we talked about the whole of shape and the taking off the skin and cutting into pieces so that you can check to see if there was some mess up inside that the animal was actually a trefa before. Trefa, normally you check after the animal's dead. First of all, it's not always easy to check when the animal's alive. So he's going to say, you can hear, see from here that Rabbi Meir doesn't think, he says, Riyat Bechor is different from Riyat Trefa. Riyat Bechor, when do you do it? You check a Bechor, Mechayim, when it's still alive. Riyat Trefa, La'achar Shchita, right? And a Riyat Trefa, you do after Shchita. Now, if you do checking a Trefa after Shchita, when do you do it? Can you do it on Yantif? Obviously, you'd have, you only can do it on Yantif because you, you can slaughter on Yantif and you only check it after Shechita. 
So therefore, he says, according to Rabbi Meir, it sounds like, if you're going to say it's not like Riyat Trefa. Riyat Trefa, right? Riyat Bechor, you do when they're alive. Riyat Trefa la'achar shchita. Umina, and from there, what can you infer? The Riyat Trefa is a filu biyomto, because if you can only do it after you slaughter the animal, obviously, we're going to permit that on Yantif, otherwise, you'd never be able to slaughter animals on Yantif. However, since Riyat Bechor is not like Riyat Trefa, Riyat Bechor me'erev yomtov. The Riyat Bechor must be done before Yantif. So from the fact that we can infer, this is a big inference, not so clear cut, and we're going to reject it in a minute, but they assume that Rabbi Meir is basically saying, the reason right, we don't allow you to eat the meat is because you did it in the wrong order. It can't be done after. If it can't be done after, then we're not going to permit it on Yantif. Right? We're only permitting checking a trefa on Yantif because it can only be done after the Shechita, but or it can also be done after the Shechita, right? I'm sure there's certain trefas you could check before, but ones that you can't check till after, you check after. But before we can't do unless it's Erev Yantif. And therefore, since, now go back to the beginning, Rabbi Yosef said, Talia Ba'ashrei Rav Rave, right? We have this whole chain of rabbis who all said like Rabbi Meir. If we pass on like Rabbi Meir, the assumption is he didn't allow you to eat meat of a Bechor that was checked after slaughtering, Therefore, we're going to assume we also wouldn't permit it on Yantif. To which Abaye rejects. Amar le Abaye. Atu hatam beroim mumin plige? That's not what their machloket was. When Rabbi Yehuda said, you can eat it. And Rabbi Meir said, you can't eat it. They weren't discussing checking mumin on Yantif. Biknasa plige. They were debating whether or not we fine the person. We give him a penalty for what he did. When Rabbi Meir said, if you checked the blemish after He's basically saying, we're forbidding you to eat it because you did it wrong. You did it in the wrong order, right? What if it hadn't been blemished, right? Then you would have really messed up. So it's a penalty that we're, that we're instituting. Now, if we had stopped here, we would basically explain this penalty as, right? You did it in the wrong order. So we're going to penalize you. If we, you know, if we permit you to eat this, then you come to do it next time in that order. And maybe it won't be blemished. And then you really have a problem because you're not allowed to slaughter a, an animal that's not blemished. If it's a before firstborn, right? You have to wait till it gets blemished. But that's not really the way they understand penalty. The penalty here is going to be understood more. It's strange. They, okay. And I'm going to kind of set it out there. There's a bit of a problem with the sugya or a difficulty with the language because kna seems to imply penalty, but the Gemara is going to use the language of gzera. Gzera is something different. Gzera is we forbid you one thing so that you don't come to mess up in a different situation. And it's going to be a very specific gzera. And it's a little bit less of a penalty, although I think it could be explained also as a combination. So we'll see. So let's read. So we kna sapligi. Da'ama rabba babarchan amara biyokhanan. Bidukin shabayin. Dukin shabayin is a type of blemish in the eye. Even Rabbi Yehuda will forbid you to eat that meat if you slaughtered it and then checked out the blemish. Why is that? There's certain, there's certain mums, blemishes, like Duke and Shabai, and thank you, Tova, for saying it's cataracts, that when you, when you slaughter the animal, we all know, right, when someone dies, okay, or when the animal gets slaughtered, it sometimes changes the look of things. So the the, the cataracts in the eye are going to get worse or more problematic once you slaughter the animal. So therefore, if the, if the expert checks the mum after death, it's going to look different than it had looked before death. And the fact that right now it's a mum kavua doesn't mean it was a mum kavua before you slaughtered it, in which case you weren't allowed to. So even in that case, Rabbi Huda doesn't permit you to eat the meat based on the chacham coming and determining it after death, because the after death determination is an irrelevant determination. So what's the machloket then? He pleaded the mumim shabaguf. The debate is mumim in the body, not in the eye. If you have a blemish on the body, which won't necessarily change when you slaughter the animal, Rabbi Meir Savar, Gazlina mumim shabaguf, atu mumim shabayin. Because we don't want you to think that a mumim in, in the eye would be the same thing, right? If the cataract issue would be the same pro- thing where you could check it after death. Therefore, we don't allow you to check anything. And that's anything you would check after death we're not going to let you eat the meat based on that psak. That's a gzera, basically. It's not exactly a penalty, although one could say it's a penalty, and I'll explain why in a second. The Rabbi Yehuda Savar lo gazdina. Rabbi Yehuda say we don't make a gzera that way. Now, why is it a penalty? Well, you could just say, we don't allow you to do this, right? But if you did it, 
once it's already done, maybe we'll permit it just for exera. So maybe it's a knas because you didn't keep this decree. Therefore, it's a knas and we're not going to let you, you know, we're going to penalize you. But in general, there's a little bit of a tricky language here between the penalty. It's more of a penalty or more of a decree. Okay. Either way you look at it, the point is that Rabbi Mayer did not permit this, did not permit you to eat the meat, not because of anything had to do with checking blemishes on Yantif, but because he instituted this penalty or, or decree, and therefore it's a side issue. It has nothing to do with the Yantif issue. So we can't make that jump that you made before. That's what Abaya says. So we're back to square one. Rav Yosef tried to prove it, that we hold like Rabbi Shimon, but in the end, Abaya rejects his proof. So we're back to square one. Amo Rav Nachman. But Rav Nachman, by Yitzchak, before we go back to square one, he wants to prove that this reading of Abai is a more accurate reading of Rabbi Meir, that it was only as a penalty, a knas. Why? The Mishnah in Bechorot that we quoted just before sounds like it's a penalty and not that it's actually forbidden by law. Because he says, if Rabbi Meir thought it was Asur by law, he would have said, I'm a Rabbi Meir, Asur. But instead of saying that, what does he say? Since it was done, not in the proper manner by an expert, right? Before you slaughtered it, it's forbidden. That language sounds much more like we're going to penalize you. Since you did it in the wrong way, we're going to penalize you rather than saying it's actually forbidden by law. Okay, so now, like I said, back to square one, can we do this or can't we do it? So again, we're going to get to situations that happen. Ami Vardina Ah, Chazu Bukhur de Bene Siahava. Ami Vardina Ah was the, was the, that was his name. He was the guy who checked the mumim in the house of the Nasi. Biyomatova lo Abachazim. And he wouldn't check them on Yantif. Atuva Amrule the Rabbi Ami. They went, and almost sounds like they tattletailed on him, and they went to Rabbi Ami, a different Ami. They went to Rabbi Ami and they said, he's not checking mumim on Yantif. Amar Lehu, Shapir Ka Avid de He said, in fact, he's doing the right thing. He's totally right. So now they say, wait a minute, Eni, is that really true that Rabbi Ami himself thinks you can't check Mumim? Now this is interesting because we did see Rabbi Ami earlier in the da, who didn't check Mumim also, it said. But right now they're going to bring a separate question. And this is always the danger of people seeing, right, seeing a story that happened or seeing a situation. But you always have to be careful if you're a leader, anything you do can be misinterpreted. So they say, what do you mean? For Rabbi Ami Rabbi Ami himself checked Mumim on check blemishes on Yantif. So now they say, well, whoever saw this obviously didn't understand the whole situation. There's two stages to checking a blemish. Until now, we've really talked about one. All we've talked about right now is you have to check was the blemish a permanent blemish or not. However, this is second issue. A Kohen is not allowed to inflict a blemish on purpose on the animal. And if he does, it's not, it's not going to permit the animal to be eaten based on that blemish because, right? Otherwise, Kalanian will all the time, right? Even, first of all, in the times of the temple, they'll say, oh, pain in the neck to go to the temple. I want to eat my animal now. I'll just inflict a wound and great, we'll be set. Or when there's no temple, right? The whole thing is they have to wait till it gets a blemish. They can't start inflicting a blemish on their own animal. So therefore, we'll see in, the, in a few minutes where they get it from in the Torah. But the point is that Rabbi Ami Kihazi but there's two stages to the expert correcting this, you know, fixing this situation. One is he checks, is it a permanent blemish? If he determines it's a permanent blemish, that's stage one. Then he still has to determine that the blemish wasn't put on by the Kohen. So he has to start asking the Kohen questions. Did you inflict the wound on the animal? How did it happen? Blah, blah, blah. blah. So basically, when they saw Rabbi Ami and they questioned based on that, that he was, he was permitting animals to be slaughtered, checking their blemishes on Yantif, it wasn't really accurate. He would check the blemishes on Erev Yantif, but he would question the Kohen, how did the blemish get there on Yantif? Okay, and now you're going to see a story that to me sounds like a very familiar story of something that might happen in my house. Um, not exactly with a blemish on a Bechor, because that doesn't really happen, but uh, it does happen that people come to ask questions on Arab Yantif from my husband who postpones, you know, all sorts of you know, all sorts of questions. People ask him all sorts of things, right? Arab Yantif, I'm getting, you know, we're trying to make 
Yantif Shabbos and, you know, people, he's sitting on the phone with some halachic question. So here comes the story, which you'll kind of laugh at. So a guy brings a bachor right in front of Rav. Okay, it's great. We're learning this today, right? Erev Yantif, which is today, Oshana Rav, Erev Simchat Torah, comes to him with a bachor. But where, what's Rav doing at the time? That's why this situation is kind of funny. This would not really happen in my house. He's shampooing, he's in the middle of washing his hair, and someone starts showing him a bachor. So, right, you have to remember, right, they generally washed in the river. They weren't washing in their own showers, right? So he's washing in the river and someone starts asking him a question. He picks up his eyes. He looks at the animal while he's shampooing his hair. And he says to the guy, right? This is very, this is something I would see in my house where, you know, someone calls her Yantif. If it's urgent, so then obviously you're going to get an answer right then, right? You're going to my husband's going to say, okay, you know, what, what's the situation? But usually what I hear him say is, is this urgent, right? Do you need me to answer this right now? Or can it wait? If it can wait, come back tomorrow, right? Or come back out, call me after young. Time. So that's exactly what he said to him, right? What he did was he, he looked at the blemish because that he knew he had to do right then. He took care of that. And then he said, I'm not going to start questioning you now, grilling you, you know, how did this blemish get here? Come back tomorrow, Anyantif. And I'll resolve the rest of it right now. I don't really have time. I'm in the middle of showering. You know, I'll deal with this later. When he got there the next day, he said, okay, what was the, how did it get blemished? How did it get this wound? He said, okay, there were, there were, there was barley on one side of this bush, this thorny bush, and the animal was on the other side. When he went to eat, he stuck his head into the bush, right? Not the smartest animal. And the bush cut his lip, and that's how he got the wound. Now, is this his fault or not his fault? The coin's fault or no? Did he cause this or did he not cause it? Not 100% clear. Did he put the, the barley on the other side of the bush so that knowing the animal would do it? So I'm relay. He says to him, Rabbi says to him, Dilma at Garample, is it possible you caused this situation to happen? Amr lay low. He said, no, no, I had nothing to do with this. So at that point, he rules for him, no problem then, right? You have to obviously, I assume he had to look at his face and see, was he, did he sound like he was lying or not, right? But in any case, he says it's fine. So what do you see here? You see a few things. Number one, he didn't rule. And it's, you can rule on them, but you can't check the blemish. The blemish has to be checked before. You can finish up the last final details of it uh, the other thing you learn here, which is Gemara's question, is that even if you indirectly cause the wound to be inflicted, then we don't count it as a blemish that's going to permit you to eat that animal, to slaughter it. So now they're going to ask that. How do we know that indirectly causing it, it's forbidden? Ditanya, as it says in the following bright. Mum lo Okay, you have to read the whole pasuk. It's vayikra kaf bet, pasuk kaf alif. Right. If you're going to bring a voluntary sacrifice, doesn't matter, right? What animal, whatever, it has to be tamim, perfect. Tamim Okay. In order to be accepted by God, can't have any mum in it. And they learn from there not only but you can't inflict the wound. Okay. That's the the obvious from here. So now they say, It's not just that it doesn't have a mum. How do you know that you can't cause it even indirectly? Now, what would be an example? They're giving you some, right? This is like, don't give him anyone any ideas. You shouldn't put a dough or sticky figs on and stick it on the animal's ear. And then what's going to happen? It's going to attract the dog. A dog will come bite off the ear. Okay. And then it'll have a moon. How do you know you can't do something like that? Talmud Lomar, call moon. Amar moon, va'amar kol moon. Moon means don't inflict it directly. Call moon comes to say don't inflict it even indirectly. Okay. New Mishnah. Okay. The rest of our daf is these two shorter Mishnayot. Okay. So we finished the issue with the, with the moon on the animal. Now we move into, and we, what we saw is that clearly the, the direction of the psikat halacha seems to be like Rabbi Shimon, you can't check mumim on yantif. Okay, now, Mishnah. Behema shem meta, lo yizizena mim koma. 
animal dies, don't move it from where it is. Okay, it dies on, on Yanta for Shabbos. It's not slaughtered, right? It's not slaughtered properly. It just drops dead. You can't move it. They asked this question to Rabbi Tarfon about this and and at about a piece of challah that was given to a Kohen, but then it became impure. It's like truma. Once it becomes impure, you can't do anything with it except burn it. Okay, and then, you know, you can use it for burning, but that's about it. You can't benefit from it really almost at all. And he didn't know, and as they asked Rabbi Tarfon, he didn't know the answer. He went to the Beit Midrash, right? It seems funny, Rabbi Tarfon wouldn't know. He didn't know the answer. And they said to him, you can't move it, right? There's a good example of a rabbi sometimes needs to understand. You might not know the answer to every question. He can go ask further. And he was told, no, they can't be moved. They're muktzah. So the Gemara starts up and says, This Mishnah sounds like it's not like Rabbi Shimon. Titania, as it says in a Braita, Rabbi Shimon Omel, um, actually, what's this? Hey, I assume it means it says in a Braita, not a Mishnah. Uh, yeah, it should be Titania, as it says in a Braita. And this is a very famous Braita. We've seen this many times. This is the famous Rabbi Shimon doesn't hold Muktzah, right? We keep, what does it mean Rabbi Shimon doesn't hold Muktzah? Well, he has a very narrow definition of what's Muktzah. He's much more lenient when it comes to Muktzah issues. Rabbi Shimon Omer, If you have a dead animal or you have gourds that aren't edible, you, but they are edible for animals, you can cut them up and give it in front of your animals or your dog. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Only if it already died before Shabbos. If it died on Shabbos, no way could you do this. So therefore, it sounds like, according to Rabbi Shimon, you can. You can use it on Shabbos, if, you know, you can give it to your dog. Obviously, then on Yantif, you can move it. So the Gemara says, no, a filu tema Rabbi Shimon. We're going to try to explain the Mishnah, how it could work like Rabbi Shimon, and we'll give a few different options. Okay, now there's an important word missing here. The, Point is, our Mishnah is referring to an animal that was healthy before Shabbos or Yantif. Then even Rabbi Shimon doesn't permit it because you, you weren't planning to give that to your dog. You were planning to eat that down the road. So of course, and, and on Shabbos especially, right, you weren't planning to eat, slaughter it, even on Yantif, right? The point is an animal that died is going to be forbidden if it was if it was healthy. But if it was unhealthy before. And it looked like it was going to die. So Rabbi Shimon says, already before Shabbat came in, you already had in mind that you might it might die. And then you'll give it to your dog. He thinks that's enough. Rabbi Huda doesn't think so. And then we say each mission is, you know, each source is talking about a different situation. Well, there's a whole debate about this situation. So it's only going to work if you hold by the person who thinks that Rabbi Shimon actually admits in the case, we're going to see this right now. We're going to see there was a debate about what, what Rava said. Mar Bar Mema thinks that Rava said, If you hold that Rabbi Meir admit, he agrees with Rabbi Yehuda, that it is Muktza if the animal was perfectly healthy before Shabbat came in. Shop here. Then we'll say, oh, our mission is talking about a situation like that. And Rabbi Shimon forbids. And therefore, our Mishnah can match Rabbi Shimon. But the Marbury de Rabbi Yosef, Mishmei de Rabbi, but Marbury de Rabbi Yosef said in the name of Rabbi, Damar Chalukaya Rabbi Shimon, a filu balechayim shemetu shemutabim. He was, he disagreed also about that case. He didn't know that was Mukta either. In which case, Ma'ika the you can't explain our Mishnah according to Rabbi Shimon. So they say, ah, Tirgu was the Eri Bebemat Kodashim. We can say the Eri said, no, let's forget about it. was an animal healthy or, or not healthy. We can assume the animal was a sanctified animal. That's what the Mishnah is talking about. It's talking about a sacrificial animal, which if it died, then there's nothing you can do with it. You can't give it to your dog. It's permitted to benefit from it in that way. So it can only be burnt. And that you're not going to burn it on Yantif. They don't allow burning Kodshim on Yantif. That's, right, that's not, wasn't one of the things permitted Mishum Ochal Nefesh. So he says it's Beimach Kodashim. And in fact, Daikonami Dekatani. Ah, and, and perfect to explain our Mishnah that way. Because the Mishnah brought this case of Rabbi Tarfa. It was asked about two things. One was the animal and one was about the chala that became impure. So why don't we say that the animal who died was also a sanctified animal, right? So just like the chala was sanctified, and then we say that it was talking about sanctified stuff, in which case in that case, Rabbi Shimon would agree. If it was a regular animal, Rabbi Shimon would think it's not muktzah, it can be moved. But a sanctified animal, there's nothing you could do with an anyantif, and therefore would be a problem. But 
they say, wait a minute. Elatama de Kadisha, that seems to imply it's only forbidden because it's sanctified. Ha de Chulin Sharia. But if it was a regular thing, it would be permitted, which is actually what we were looking to say. But, right, because that's Rabbi Shimon. But that only depends. Now we're doing the mirror image of what we just did. That depends on how you understand what Rabbi Shimon says. If you're going to assume the Mishnah time about Kachim, well, then it's only going to match one of those two opinions. Because then Chulin will be permitted. That only means Hani Chalamar Bereda Rav Yosef Mishmeda Rav Adamar Chalukaya Rabbi Shimon. Right? It would only work if you say that he disagreed right, and permitted animals that were healthy before Shabbos and died on Shabbos. And then that would mean our mission is talking about sanctified ones, but non-sanctified ones would be permitted. But if he agrees that if the animal was healthy before Yantif, it would be forbidden to use if it died because that wasn't the use you were planning for it. Then, right, you were planning to eat it, not to give it to your dog. Then it wasn't ready for that. Then it doesn't make any sense. So what do they answer? It must have been an animal that was unhealthy already and looked like it was going to die before Yantif and was sanctified. And then that works according to everybody. Because then it implies if it was unhealthy and chulin, Rabbi Shimon would have permitted it. Right. Everyone agrees with that case, and that maybe is how you can explain it, according to all the opinions. The whole idea here was to try to say, does our Mishnah only hold by Rabbi Yehuda, or can we explain the Mishnah somehow according to Rabbi Shimon, and we gave a bunch of different possibilities. Finishing up now with the last Mishnah. Now we're talking about how do you sell an animal in your store on Yantis. One thing you have to remember, I go into a butcher shop, right? You ask for a piece of meat, you want a kilo, a pound, or whatever it is. You ask for the amount that you want. In those days, you didn't do that because they didn't have refrigerators, freezers. They wouldn't slaughter an animal unless they knew they had X amount of people that were going to eat that animal. So people would be nim nim. They would go in a group together and say, together, we're going to go in this group. I'm going to get X amount of, you know, I'm going to buy two slaim of the animal. You're going to buy two slaim and, you know, you kind of work it out. So you can't do that on Yantip and all decide we're going to go together with this animal, each one getting a certain amount of money's worth of the animal. We can decide before Yantif. And then on Yantif, they slaughter it and then they split it up between the people. There's a debate about these last three words. Are they referring to if you planned it before Yantif? Or are they referring to if you didn't plan it before Yantif, then you can't go in a group. What would happen? The owner would slaughter it. And then he would just divide it among whatever people are there, and they just wouldn't have gone in with the group and planned it all from before. So there's two different ways to understand those words. My enimim. So now the Gemara says, what does it mean, enimim? So I'm of Yudam Rashmuel. Ein poskim damim l'chatchila ala beima b'yomt. You can't go in together with, a, a, and start talking about money. If you don't talk about money, it's okay. You have to remember, mekachum emkar, doing business on Yantif or Shabbos, it's really not such a problem, halachically. The rabbi, it's just a gzera de rabbanan. And the reason is because we're worried people are going to write things down. But remember, in the barter system, it's not as big a deal, right? Transferring things. I mean, there's problem with Kenyan on Shabbat, whatever. But generally, it's less of a halakhic problem than we think it is. So what they're saying is you just can't start talking about money. When you get involved with money, that's already like a regular weekday. But if you do it in a way that they don't get into money, it's okay. So hechiyab, it's how do you do it? Right. I mean, what about the store owner? How's he doing this without dealing with money? Right. He's got a store, he's got a business, a livelihood. So what he does is he finds two animals that are alive. He says, Oh, these look about the same size, or this one's a little bigger, a little smaller. He puts aside one of them, he slaughters the other. And after Yandif, he knows about how much he slaughtered, what the value is because he's got the other animal. Tanya Namiyaf, here's another bride to prove that this is how you do it. This proves Rav Yehud Shmuel, who said you can't talk about money. You can't go together and say, I want a sela's worth, right? I want two slaims worth. Avalomer, right? That's a coin. You can say, I'll go in for half, I'll go in for a third, I'll go in for a quarter. That you're allowed to say. That's how you do it. Tomorrow's stuff is all going to be about. Can you weigh the animal? How far away do you have to veer from weights and measuring? And you know what kind of things are permitted or are forbidden when it comes to selling anyantif? And with that, we'll finish for today. Have a chag everyone. I uh, hope you have a special Hoshana Rabbah planned. 
and we will meet up again. Today's DAF will go up in about the next half hour and, and tomorrow's DAF and, uh, and we will meet up after Chag, after Chag Rishon in right the first day of Chag in, in uh, Israel. Okay, have a great day, everyone. Hug some air.